All right, next up we have Bob Cook. And many of us know Bob Cook at Blairstown as our one of the instructors. How many of you guys here have been taught to fly by Cookie? And he and Bob was certainly uh, certainly my club instructor. He taught my brother and I how to fly. I we spent hours and hours and hours at Runway Cafe. And uh, I, mean, how, how, I mean, how much money do you think you cost the cafe and the napkins that you drew on? Uh, yeah, they take them away from me, actually. <laughs> and uh, but you know, he has a real knack for going and really. You know, really teaching fundamental concepts in a way that make a lot of sense, and a way that are really practical, and in a way that really works. I mean, here's an example, right? So we would, I, I still hear his voice in my head. You know, I hear voices. <laughs> it's, uh, and we're on, on face like is keep the nose down, keep the nose down, keep the goddamn nose down. You know, and I still, still hear it. You know, so today he's going to tell us, talk to us about. Uh, what happens when things don't go so well on a ridge and when the music stops? You know, and, and Cookie will tell us all about that. Give him a round of applause. No, no. Uh, okay, well, if anybody took the time to read this, you're going to learn that my presentation is a little different, my okay. approach. What? That's what an intentionally blank page is supposed to look like. <laughs> yeah, I'm Okay, I'm going to ask you all to read along with me while I read this. This is a little something, kind of hits the nail on the head about my philosophy of aviation. So, let's uh, read this together. Dear Captain, my name is Nicola. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't fuck up the landing. <laughs> Love the cola with kisses. <laughs> uh, that's the point of my uh, talk today. But when Daniel gave me the assignment for this, what came to mind about ridge flying, the way I think about it, when the music stops, options and solutions when the ridge condi conditions deteriorate, I think of ridge flying like the game of musical chairs. When you're playing musical chairs, the music is playing. When the music stops, you better have a place to park your butt. Okay? If you're one of these guys on the end, you might have a problem. So when the music stops on the ridge, when I'm flying the ridge, there's nice music in my head. And when things turn bad, that music stops, and this is what happens. Uh, next slide. Oh, wait, this <laughs> okay, I'm going to be a little Captain Obvious today. Um, a couple of things. I'm going to overlap some of the previous um, presentations. I think repetition is a good thing for some of this rich stuff. We can pound these things uh, into your head. Um, we have in our presence today some of the top pilots that are out there. Um, that's a very small percentage of the rest of us, like myself, sort of weekend warriors, um, what I call amateur pilots. So I'm going to present from more of an amateur point of view. Not that we don't want to have fun, we want to get better, we want to challenge ourselves, but we're not going to use some of the techniques that that top 5% uh, use. Uh, <laughs> Just a little thing, Daniel and I have this conversation all the time about the sport of soaring. Obviously, that's not soaring. <laughs> um, I call it an extreme sport. Um, and I think we have to treat it that way. Soaring has gotten good press over the years. Everybody says, oh, it's safe, it's whatever, it's easy. Uh, generally, soaring pilots are intelligent, well-educated, introverts, there's this air of kind of safety around soaring, which may or may not be true. Um, I don't know what could possibly go wrong with this idea, so. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about ex extreme sports, I'm going to talk about not extreme sports. We have chess, or checkers, 
We have bad mat, badminton and golf. All of these sports take a lot of skill, a lot of, to be good at it, these people are really good. But my criteria is the lack of skill or the lack of knowledge or making mistakes in these sports is unlikely to result in death. <laughs> so if we can go to the next slide. What do we think about soaring? Soaring, by my definition, is an extreme sport. <coughs> should be treated that way. We should have the mindset that this is an extreme sport. And we're talking about rich soaring today, which is the extreme end of an extreme sport. So I think we all have to keep that in mind uh, when we're ridge flying. <laughs> Pilots, um, we have our own way of speaking, our own vocabulary, and we may tend to exaggerate things sometimes. So I heard some of the vocabulary already today. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, when we fly a ridge, we have certain words that we use. <laughs> so, the ridge is working. I think you heard that today. Yes. That means you're going to go out, the ridge is going to work. You're going to have a good flight. Jonathan used this. The ridge is honking. That means that ridge is great. You've got no worries. You're going to have a great flight. It's going to be pretty powerful. He used the term gentleman's ridge. That's a ridge that's a little more mellow. You know, you can go out there, relax a little bit, take it easy, um, but really have a nice flight. We use the term milk run. Oh, uh, Hawk Mountain back was a milk run. It was very, very easy. No brainer, very similar to that. By the way, you know how they say Eskimos have 20 words for snow? <laughs> we have hundreds of words for, for ridge. 100 mile an hour ridge, that was talked about today. Um, in a high performance plane, that's a pretty good solid ridge. One of my favorite ones, Jonathan says this all the time, surprised he didn't say it. The ridge lift was so good you could fly a golf cart. <laughs> an exaggeration or not? I don't know, there's the evidence. Okay, but I'm not here to talk about all that good stuff. I'm here to talk about this. Oh, if we can, can we go back two slides? Just look at the elation here. This lady is actually a glider pilot. Couldn't be happier, right? Everything's good. Now two slides forward. <laughs> this guy, not so good. So we're going to use some of the, the language that things are not too good. Like the ridge is not working. The ridge is marginal. Falling off the ridge. I think you heard that before. We're going to talk about that a little more. The ridge is weak. The ridge is soft. The ridge is dying. The ridge is scary. When you hear Bobby Templin on the radio, <laughs> that section was scary. Now you know you've got a problem. The hairs stand up on the back of your neck. Experts only ridge. This is what we, we kind of hit on earlier. When the winds on the ground are 25, 30, you can't really even get in the air safely. So a lot of times, we'll let the top pilots, they can deal with that experts only ridge. They usually take off early in the morning, land late at night. Um, you really don't, we talked about it, you don't want to land in the middle of the day. Um, 60 mile an hour ridge. Notice before I had 100 miles an hour. Well, 60, that's a, that's a workable ridge. But it was 100. Yep. Now it's 60. Uh-oh, what's going on? And actually, some of you high performance guys, you don't want to fly, that's not fast enough, right? Carl, you were saying you want to be 80? So 60 is a warning sign. <laughs> winds are west. We talked about the winds being off angle or the winds are north. So these are kind of the, the things that can happen that are not so good, a deteriorating ridge. <laughs> we said falling off the ridge. You heard that a lot of times. Well, Mr. Coyote here, he's an expert at falling off of ridges. And again, he's falling off a ridge here. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration. It's not that bad. In fact, Mr. Coyote here has figured out <laughs> we can glide off of the ridge 
or slide or fly or whatever you want to call it. Here's the problem. We're flying basically at pattern height. The time between flying along fat, dumb, and happy and parked in a field could be three to four minutes. Okay? Uh, in terms of distance, you might have two, three, maybe four miles at best. So using the term falling off the ridge, I think, is a good term because it's almost, it's not that bad, but it's almost that bad. Okay, why does the ridge go bad, soft, weak, stop working, etc.? cetera? Uh, again, Jonathan hit on a, a few of these things, the earlier things. There has to be a change. If it's working, it's working. If it's not working, what changed? Well, it's a lack of energy, okay? When a glider is flying at ridge height, a little above the ridge at a certain speed, you have energy and height and speed take you for that four minutes and <coughs> three miles. We need a constant influx of energy from the ridge to keep going. Well, if the velocity changes, if the direction changes, the ridge direction changes, the shape of the ridge, the height of the ridge, flying out of a weather pattern, obstruction, thermal suck, or wave, these are all the things that cause the ridge to deteriorate. So let's talk about solutions and options in decision making. What are we going to do? That ridge is deteriorating. We, we need a solution. Okay, <laughs> here's the thing. I think Jonathan hit at this. When the ridge changes, you have to notice it now. You don't have the four minutes you're on the ground. You have to make that decision in the first 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So this is one of my favorite things. You've got to come to grips with the stark uh, reality of the situation. Uh, this guy is well prepared. Uh, of course, we want to... Uh, Two. Uh, this is what you can't do. <laughs> you can't be Mr. Magoo and just continue blindly along. You know, clueless, oblivious. Um, when something changes, you have to deal with it. So do something, right? You can't do nothing. You have to do something. Uh, the idea is what what are some of the somethings uh, that you can do? So. This was a favorite phrase of his, why don't you do something to help me? Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about some of the actual uh, things that we can do. So you're, you're flying along, you don't like the feel of the ridge, looks like it's going to be a problem. One obvious one is turn around. I think we talked about that before. Hey, it was good back there. It's not good here. Why don't I go back there? Okay. Now. This might be a temporary thing. If you have a task or something planned, maybe you back up, conditions get better, you can continue ahead. Or maybe you abandon your task for the day, turn around, go back where it's good, and fly for a few hours and enjoy yourself. Like Jonathan said, a lot of us just fly for the fun of it, just for the joy of being in the air or not uh, to prove anything. So turning back can often be a, a good solution, okay? But there's a problem with turning back. I don't know how many of you knew Tony Benson. I think this is a good rendition of him. He was an instructor at Blairstown. Uh, Tony says, don't turn back and go through the same minefield. So once you've walked through the minefield, if you went through a section of ridge that wasn't really that good, you really don't want to turn around and go back through that again. So turning around may not be the best option. When things go bad and you try a solution, like I said, you've only got a couple of minutes. If it doesn't work, you're going to land. Okay? When I say here, prepare to land, when you're ridge flying, you're always prepared to land. You have to know where those fields are, where those musical chairs are. You have to be prepared to land. But in this case, when the ridge went bad, you turned around, it didn't get any better, what I mean by prepare to land here is prepare. You're going to do your checklist. You've got everything figured out, and you're, you're going to go in the field. Okay, another solution. Instead of 
turning around, sometimes it's better just to keep going. If you know the next section of ridge, better shape or better direction, chances are things are going to get better as you keep going. You don't want to turn around and go through that minefield again, so keep going. Another thing I've noticed when I fly with beginners, they get a bad part of the ridge and they're scared to do anything, so they kind of linger in that not such a good spot. So just going anywhere else, you have a chance of it getting better. So keep going is sometimes a good solution. The other thing is, sometimes the problem is only momentary. You know, you just hit a little bad spot in the ridge. If you keep going, that ridge uh, might get better. But, prepare to land. Okay? If, that, if you go ahead and it doesn't get any better, you better have your field prepared to land. Okay, another option. And then we talked about this today. If you're barreling along at 100 knots and it gets a little softer, it might work at 80 knots. It might work at 70 knots. It might work at 60 knots. Going slower might put you up a little higher. Gives you a little breathing room. Um, sometimes slowing down just gives you time to think. You just want to slow the pace of things down a little bit. So slowing down can be an option. But you notice I said slower, but not too slow. Flying very slow on a ridge to me is a very bad idea. Uh, and again, I think Carl said it too. When you get below a certain speed, it's not really worth it. Um, a rule of thumb for me is best glide speed is about the slowest I ever want to go on a ridge. And um, experts can go slower in certain circumstances, but slow down, but not too slow. And of course, when that doesn't work, prepare to land. When I looked at this slide for a while, this I found this interesting. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Right did everybody see that, what I pointed to? Turkey baster. They got the plug in the uh, little pedo and air vent. Oh. <laughs> they didn't want all that blood and shit to get in there. <laughs> right, right. So I don't know if that's why, why they landed. Okay, another good solution. There was a lot of talk about this today. Things aren't so good on a ridge. Find a thermal. There's, there's no problem so big it can't be run away from. <laughs> so if the ridge isn't working very well, try to thermal out of there. Now, we talked about some of the problems of thermaling, thermaling low. You kind of have to know what you're doing to thermal off a ridge, uh, dog bones or whatever. But um, this is a nice solution because if, if you start climbing, immediately things are getting better. You have more time, more options, more to think. Um, I don't know if we talked about all of the problems about low thermaling. There's some optical illusions. Uh, there's some speed control issues. So you have to be very careful. And, and you've got to know what you're doing to do this. There's another problem with thermaling off a ridge. Well, you thermaled off the ridge. Now you fly on. Well, you've got to come back down to the ridge somewhere. The problem here is, what are you coming back to? And if it's a ridge you're not familiar with, or you don't know the conditions, or you haven't tested, it's very dangerous to drop out of a thermal onto an unknown ridge. I've actually landed out twice because I dropped out of a thermal. I didn't trust the ridge and, and landed out. So, um, by the way, this is my standard symbol for thermal nowadays. I <laughs> and of course, if it doesn't work, Prepare to land. Next one. Okay, another option is to go lower. Now this one can be tough. If you're a beginner, you're a little scared or whatever. But we determined from the other presentations that that good ridge lift is close into that crest, lower. Very often if you're cruising up high, it feels very weak. <coughs> not a lot of lift. And as you tuck yourself into that ridge, that lift gradient is very strong down there. So you can get through a rough section sometimes by actually going lower. Can I tell you a quick story? Go ahead. Did you ever meet Paul Wynn? 
Yes. Bowen is a well-known uh, NASA pilot. He was an F-16 Belgian Air Force wow. pilot, I think Huron, whatever. First time Bowen flew Ridge down at, at Newcastle, it was laughable, right? He was he was 800 feet up, at like a mile out in front yeah. of the ridge, and he kept falling off, and he was barely climbing back up. Two years later, you know, Bowen was was flying a thousand feet every weekend out of NASA, and and part of that was he just spent so much time practicing exactly this, like figuring out what that looks like in that comfort band. So, you know, spot on, but yeah, yeah. it's an option. Now, when you fly lower, your time frame has shrunk. Instead of four minutes, you might have two minutes before you're on the ground. So, so it is a little more uh, risky. And of course, if this doesn't work, what are we going to do? <laughs> Repair the land. Prepare. See a little thing going there, right? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, uh, for you rock fans here, these this wonderful looking bunch of lads here, The Clash, uh, famous song, a musical question, should I stay or should I go? So I talked about turning around, I talked about keep going. Well, maybe we don't want to keep going. Okay, so next slide. If you have a good landing option, Sometimes a good choice is to stay where you are. If you can hang on, <laughs> conditions may improve. So if you're not going down and you have a landing field, just hang out, see, see what happens, experiment a little bit. So you notice there's no set answer to what you do when there's a problem. You have to make, make that decision. Okay, of all <laughs> strategies, knowing when to quit may be the best. The thing is, you don't have a lot of time. If things aren't working out for you, if you do that Mr. Magoo thing, you're getting deeper and deeper into trouble. So based on your own abilities, know when to quit. Don't fly that ridge anymore. Go for that landing field. OK. Um, interesting. Who was it? Kellerman. Kellerman said he never landed out off a ridge. Well, I don't know the exact uh, statistics, but I've kind of kept track of my own flights and flights out of Blairstown over the years. The probability of landing out on a ridge flight. Now, keep in mind, you're going to pick a good day. You've practiced. You've, you've studied. Um, you kind of know what you do, and you've had some training. You're probably not going to land out. The probability of landing out on a ridge flight is very, very low, at least in my opinion and, 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 and what I've studied. So we fly miles and miles and miles and hours and hours and hours, and we really don't do any land outs. That builds a complacency. Next slide. What's the possibility of landing out? Okay. From probability to possibility, the possibility is 100%. You could land out on any ridge flight at any time. So as we say, crap happens. I wish that was my goal. Um, next slide. <laughs> Bobby Templin, one of our, our top pilots here, a quote he made some years ago. At one time or another, somebody has fallen off of each and every section of our ridge. Okay. Didn't you say that? Where's Bobby? Oh, didn't you say that? Well, he said it now. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> he said it one, one, one time on the deck. It's, um, so on a good day, people fall off the ridge. On a bad day, they fall off the ridge. On a good section, on a bad section. Set on the deck, stay on the deck. Right. So you have to have in mind that here's this ridge flying. is so darn easy, but you're right on the edge. It's that extreme sport. So you have to be prepared to land out. Uh, at any time, and know how to do it. Um, nice glider here, you too. Uh, <laughs> when you land off field from a ridge flight, you may have a modified or abbreviated pattern or some kind of unconventional pattern. You might not have the luxury of what the book says, like from a thermal land out. Uh, you know, looking for a field at this height and narrowing them down and planning the pattern and overflowing the field, you got like a minute. So it's going to be 
possibly a modified pattern. And of course, you have to check for all of these problems. Uh, gusty conditions, typically on a ridge day. You might land with a tailwind or a crosswind. You need to practice your off-field landings at home. Landing off a ridge is not the time to figure out how to land in a small field or how to land with a crosswind. So you've got to spend time at the home airport creating possible scenarios of off-field landing situations. Okay, when we land from a ridge flight, field selection. This is kind of dark, but from a thermal landing, here is like 500 acres to, to land. <laughs> From a ridge, this might be all you got. You got the power plant, the trees, the apartment complex, a rise here, and you gotta get into that little field. So before you're ridge flying, you better know that that might be the only field you have to get in there. So you may have to lower your standards. Thermal flying feels like that, ridge flying feels like that. All right, there was a little talk about this earlier. If you do decide, you know, you're going to take the Chinese proverb and you're going to quit. If we're above the ridge, we do have an option of going to a downwind side of the ridge or an upwind side of the ridge uh, to look for fields. And it's funny for all my hang around Blairstown, people always told me, never do this. And I went around and asked people why. I never really got a good answer. So, next slide. So I try to give some thought to it. Bailing out downwind, well, if that's where the field is, that's where you gotta go. If there's no field here, of course you're gonna go downwind. Um, around Blairstown, at least from down toward Hawk Mountain, generally the fields, I'm talking about a Northwest Ridge, by the way, the fields on the uh, Southeast side tend to be better fields, larger and flatter um, and the valley floor tends to be a little lower here. So there is something to be said for going over the top uh, this way. You also will have a tailwind component, which might extend your glide. The problems are, once you cross this ridge, you're going to hit a big sink. I call it a one-way ticket. If you find a thermal or some solution over here, you're probably never going to get back to the ridge. So you're kind of stuck over here. Unless and of course, the Reverend, the was Reverend that? made it from the downwind. Was that? The Reverend made it in the story. He went downwind and thermal and back up. Back. But that's, a, that's yeah. unlikely. So, can, I, can I step in? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, for the number of 1.6 guys in the room, you might not make it to the bottom of the mountain where the valley is if the wind's honking and you got fell off the ridge, right? Okay, so a, a couple of issues. Couple of other reasons why they say don't go down the Well, a couple of issues. Like Unless you're going to Sladington or something worthwhile. Yes. There, some places the ridge is wide and flat here. So you might not make it across if you're not high enough. There is a big sink over here. Okay. Um, again, Daniel and I discussed this a little bit. If you do this choice, you have to do it early while you still yep. got height. You don't want to get yourself down in here and try to make this jump because you're going to have all of those problems. But when you think about it, when we fly at Blairstown, we make this downwind jump every time we come back to the airport. We leave the ridge, we fly 3.5 miles to Blairstown Airport and do some sort of a landing pattern. Um, this can be done in a high performance ship if you just clear the ridge. 126, maybe you need to be a little more. But it's something to think about going that way. But again, if there's no fields here, you've got to go there. It's also downhill. Though, there, yes, it's um, downhill. To, yeah. to, to Dave's point and, and a bigger point is that when things are not working, when you are preparing to land, that the earlier you quit, given, the right. better. That meaning, if you're having to crawl, if you have to go over the back or something like that, or you have to go to a marginal field someplace in a distance, plus or minus 100 feet is the difference between making it okay and being really, 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 really scared. Yeah. And yes. so then, and going over the back is just a really good example of this in the sense that, well, you got to have that extra margin, but this is true for anything you do 
when it comes to when things start getting really dicey. But but again, if there's no fields here, yep. I'm going to leave a lot earlier. If I know my only fields are here, I'm going to leave a lot earlier. Yep. You can fly through that sink. You have to go like hell, and it's scary. And we do it going back to Blair's son all the time. We fly through his sink. The other thing is you have to know where that field is, and you have to fly straight there. Now, I did say there's a chance of a thermal out here. That's if you leave pretty high and get in there. Um, I have done that in thermal doubt, and I, I thermaled for an hour and then landed anyway. A lot of, a lot of sucker lift, too, though. Yes. Yes. At Blairstown, is it always the same exit point off the ridge? No, I don't want to get into that, but it depends on the wind direction, okay. uh, whether you get a thermal or not. There's, there's a lot of way. We don't do it the same way all the time. In fact, in soaring, nothing's done the same way all the time. <laughs> Next one. So, an upwind bailout. Well, I think Jonathan mentioned this too, and I'll talk about it again. The lift gets weak out here, but it doesn't necessarily die right away. So, when we're on the windward side, we might have some residual lift, maybe not enough to keep going. So, we might have an extended range on that windward side. A thermal is always possible, maybe not the best. The downside is if your field is out away from the ridge, you are bucking the headwind. Of course, once you dip below this ridge top, all the options are gone there, Captain Obvious. The terrain on this side, at least around Blairstown, tends to be more rolly, uh, hilly, not so level of fields, uh, smaller fields. Uh, and of course, there could be a lot of turbulence and stuff down there too. So, um, you know, that's your options. They, they're not always the best, but you gotta gotta pick one and, and go with it. <clears throat> Here's my example of of the, the ridge is is weak, so you can't continue. But this residual lift, um, you can go a long way. You know, if that air is only a hundred feet a minute up. What does that do to a, a 120? It doubles the glide ratio, right? So if you have a field that's a little distance away, stick with that ridge as long as you can before you go into that field. Mm. Okay, this is something Daniel and I had a long talk about this. And uh, I think somebody mentioned a little bit. When you're uh, an amateur flying the ridge, figure out the routes that everybody follows, okay? Stick with the well-known routes. Some of the experts sometimes come up with a new way of doing things. Us amateurs, you're not going to reinvent the wheel. So study what the other guys do, talk to other people, look at their flights, and have an idea of where you're going, and stick to those well-known routes. <laughs> do not go where you should not go. <laughs> And this guy is waiting for you. The demons are waiting. Um, a lot of times when people out of Blairstown have had a bad day, and we kind of talk to them afterward or we review their flight, the first question is, what the heck were you doing there? <laughs> okay, so if you know where to go, but better know where you should not go. Okay, flying through <laughs> unlandable areas. And uh, anybody that was a student of mine, uh, Rob Dunning had to leave, but he reminded me of this. When I do my little sketches, the unlandable spot is always the alligator pit. So, unlandable areas. And those of you who are observant, <laughs> okay, so do we fly through areas where there are no landable fields? The answer is yes. Okay. Is it risky? Yes. Is it more risky than where there are no? Yes. Okay. How do we do it? A couple of things. One is we make predictions for what we expect for the day. Um, if those predictions are coming true in the landable areas, you know, this section of ridge, Working just like I expected. Wind looks good, everything. This section looks good. When I get to this section, 
I can surmise based on the past performance that section is going to work. Again, a Daniel concept is when you go to an unlandable area, that ridge has to work as good or better than any other ridge you've worked on. You can't go into an unlandable area that's crap. <laughs> okay? So, yes, we do fly. I mean, somebody mentioned earlier today you get through there as fast as you can. That, you know that musical chairs? When you're at the end of the chairs, <laughs> you want to get around uh, to a landable area. Uh, Daniel brought up something else interesting that he does. He makes fields where nobody else could make a field out of it. If your skill level, this is for experts, if your skill level is high enough, some tiny little field might be landable to you, but probably not landable to us uh, amateurs. But if you get one landable spot, you just cut your unlandable uh, distance in half. Another thing you can do as, a, uh, as an amateur, thermal up. Avoid the issue altogether. Thermal high enough over an unlandable area that it becomes, it becomes landable. But again, the danger is dropping out of that thermal onto I don't know what, what kind of ridge. Okay, I do a lot of work with motorcycle safety, and I kind of stole this graph from the world of motorcycles. It's basically uh, risk versus skill. We call it risk offset. We want our skill level to be higher than the risk that we're willing to take. Now you notice for ridge flying, I started risk halfway up the halfway up the dial here. Okay, you can't fly ridge without quite a bit of risk. You notice I also put the skill required more than halfway up. Okay, so real quick, I think I made five pilots here. Let's run through them real quick. We're going to start with number five. You notice his risk acceptance is very very low. His skill. Not the greatest, but notice his skill is better than his risk. This is a safe pilot, risk offset. This pilot here, number four, he's willing to take some risk, but not enough for ridge flying. His skill is quite good. He's got a big risk offset. Very safe pilot, but he's not willing to fly a ridge. He doesn't want to take those risks. The green guy, he's willing to take enough risk to fly the ridge, but his skill is no higher than his risk. This is what we call a flatliner. <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of how it might end up. So these guys have no business flying the ridge. Uh, I'm going to jump up to, well, I'll go to this guy. Okay, you notice he's a risk taker. Okay, well into the, willing to take the risks involved in ridge flying. But look at his skill level. This guy is an expert. He is actually quite safe on the ridge because his skill level is way above the risks that he's taking. So he's relying on his skill. The guy I worry about, the purple guy, and we probably all know people like this, uh, real risk taker. Now this guy has got good skills, okay? But maybe he thinks a little more of himself. You know, it's self-assessment, honest. So he's, he's taking every risk there is, relying on his uh, skill level. So I think it's important that we, we do a self-assessment, honestly, and, and kind of fly the ridge with that in mind. <laughs> okay, so you're fortunate enough to get the uh, best glider there ever was. What does that do to your skill level? Back on the chart. Absolutely nothing. It might go down. Yeah, it may down. go down. The beauty about ridge flying, especially Blairstown, many of the super flights were all done in 126s. You know, Blairstown's famous. Good flights done in the high performance planes, too. But the plane doesn't give you the skill. And unfortunately, I've seen the opposite in my experience. Next slide. <laughs> you look at this one carefully. So you put in the latest avionics package. We have uh, three TV sets. <laughs> I don't know how good you guys can, can see that. And I don't know, I think I counted 47 instruments. <laughs> what did Eric say later? What do you need, Eric? Ass and eyeballs. 
<laughs> and airspeed, airspeed and altimeter if you're lucky. Yaw string. And, and, and maybe a yaw string, yeah. A, a yaw string, maybe. But um, <laughs> this doesn't give you skill. Don't let this give you a false confidence. Okay, just a little hint. Um, you know that guy that says you may be a redneck if... Yeah. Well, your risk may be higher than you think if... On your home computer, when you fill out a form and this drop-down suggests your title, Mr. Mrs., you know, Professor, if your computer comes up with crazy, wild, <laughs> crash, or whoa, uh, your risk may be higher than you think. Uh, these are actual friends of mine. Uh, they're not in the gliding world, but Crazy Vinny, Wild Willie, Crash Parade, and Whoa Johnny. <laughs> so if your friends start calling you by those names, rethink your risk assessment. Okay, let's talk about experience. And here I'm talking about flight experience. Um, our club has some sort of guidelines, so many hours on the ridge, this or that. Um, and that's sort of in hours. Well, I was talking to, uh, is Chip here? No. Chip here today? Uh, Chip, former president of our club, great 126 Ridge pilot. And we started flying in the early 80s together at the same time. Chip said to me, Bob, you know, back then I think we flew the local ridge, meaning the eight mile ridge, for three years before we crossed the water gap. And we flew a lot. So the experience that we gain, you can learn everything you need to know about a ridge in the relative safety of that local ridge. And we didn't know we were missing anything. To us, it was just being up there flying for hours on end and not having to land. So we had a good base of experience before we really started going for longer flights. So hours almost don't matter. Years, well, if they're productive years. And I'm going to tell you that ridge flying, glider flying, is a lifetime sport. You just get better and better and better. Um, some of the pilots here, they're doing their best flights after years and years of flying. So um, there's no substitute for experience. There's no shortcuts. Um, I will say that as time went on, um, when I learned to fly, I really had no instruction on the ridge. I just figured it out and did things the hard way. So you can cut corners a little bit, things like this seminar. Daniel's made all kinds of materials available. You can move maybe a, a little quicker. But don't rush it. Have fun. Enjoy the flying. Do your <laughs> homework now. Okay. Um, again, Daniel and I have been friends since he started. Um, I know how much time and effort Daniel puts in behind the scenes in flying. Um, people think, you know, he just went out and did all these miraculous flights, and he moved along quite quickly. The hours and hours and hours in the background is just, just unbelievable. So you do have to do your homework. Planning, preparation, and practice is no substitute. That results in performance. Okay, here's a little example. A buddy of mine, back in high school, we were 16 years old. This guy could play guitar unbelievable. So one day I was over at his house, and he was playing, and I said, geez, how did you get so good? You must practice a lot. He said, well, I used to practice a lot, but not so much anymore. Now I only play about six hours a day. <laughs> so keep that in perspective when you see these top 5% pilots that we have, they put the effort in. Um, you can't just shortcut that. Uh, again, for the homework, so many things are available nowadays. Simulator practice, maps, charts, check out the previous flights. I don't want to get into Bill's thing too much here, but all of this stuff is available to you very easy nowadays. Uh, here's just an example of a CU flight. Steve's flight, actually. Uh, that, that's good. You can go there. This is uh, Daniel has on the internet this this map that tells you everything. You can study it. Um, next slide. The bull <laughs> sessions on the deck. This is where I learned 
about soaring. Uh, at Blairstown, after a day of flying, we meet at the deck called the Hilton. Uh, adult beverage, bull session. We'll take one little aspect of ridge flying and beat it to death for three hours. <laughs> but I've been there over 30 years listening to these top guys, you know, guys I'll never be as good as them. But things that I didn't even know what they were talking about, over the years it makes sense. It makes sense. There's a kind of person that comes to the airport, flies the glider, gets in their car, and goes home. They are missing the whole thing. This is fun, uh, hanging out with the guys, talking with the guys. Uh, topics do change a little bit sometimes. <laughs> off the flying, sometimes it's time to go home. Uh, but this is a free education in soaring. And it's funny that soaring is sort of an individual sport. You're up there flying by yourself. But it's a very social sport, too, if, if you do it right. So, um, boy, if you want to learn about, uh, about soaring, just, just hang out with the guys that, that know. They're willing to um, teach you stuff, too. Okay, we alluded to this earlier. Here's Aero the Albatross. And this is a big problem. On a good ridge day, it's too easy. Ridge flying, when, when it's working, you're driving that golf cart. There's, there's really nothing to it. And somebody with fairly low skills can kind of get away with it. But we really should train our pilots on the marginal days. Uh, Jonathan alluded to that several times. Here's the problem. All right, uh, tomorrow, Bob, the winds are going to be off kilter and light and craft, and there's no thermals. Uh, take me up on a ridge and show me ridge flying. <laughs> I don't really want to do that. I want to take the students up on the good days. You kind of have to do this on your own in maybe little stages, you know, uh, and maybe spend that time on the local ridge in relatively relative safety of, of landing areas. So um, this is a problem in, in getting the training. I think a lot of guys taught themselves, had some bad experiences early on. Thank God they got through it. But... Um, I think Jonathan said the same thing, flying on the lighter winds or, or whatever. Um, so I think I have one more slide that I'm going to wrap it up with. This is kind of getting back to Nicola's little letter, one of my sayings. Uh, by the way, when I take my human suit off, uh, I look like that. <laughs> the cookies, <laughs> cookies, and I want you to take this away with you the next time you fly and every time you fly. I want this, keep this in your mind. The ultimate goal of every flight is a beautiful landing at the end. The rest of the flight, it actually doesn't matter. As long as you have a beautiful landing at the end, come back and do it again. And thanks for listening. Um, if there are any questions, we got a little bit of time. Uh, next slide. Hope I didn't leave you more confused than when you started. And we do take complaints and complaints about how we handle the complaints. <laughs> I have a question. One question. One yes. Question. I hate to ask that question. So, but if the bottom falls out and you have to land in the tree, do we have any recommendations? Land in the trees. Slowly. <laughs> Still be flying. Where's Paul? Fly into the trees. Don't stall. Don't spin. <laughs>